Fish Migration in the Connecticut River, Overcoming Barriers, a presentation by Frank Barris, Southern Connecticut State University. In this presentation, I will give a general background on anadromous fish in Connecticut, the proliferation of dams in the United States, and how these two interact, including common fish passage methods and the resulting problems. I will then go over a problem in this field that I'd like to study, which is the upstream and downstream passage of American Shad in the Connecticut River. I'll give an overview of the methods used at dams on the main stem of the river, and evidence of problems with downstream passage systems. I will look at some organizations that are investigating this topic, sources of funding and some contact info, and potential research problems. Anadromous fishes spend most of their adult lives at sea and return to freshwater to spawn, where juveniles develop and travel back downstream to marine habitats. There are quite a few species of these fish that occur in Connecticut. Atlantic sturgeon are listed as threatened in Connecticut and are rarely seen in many Atlantic states. These prehistoric looking fish can reach 12 feet, weigh 800 pounds, and live up to 75 years. Due to its massive potential size, historical overharvest, and from river obstructions, populations are currently low and spawning grounds are sparse. In New England, only the Hudson River supports spawning Atlantic sturgeon populations. American shad are the main focus of this presentation. It's a member of the Clupidae or herring family, which includes blueback herrings, alewives, Manhattan, and others. American shad is the Connecticut state fish and a common visitor to the Connecticut River. Shad run sizes fluctuate by year and are greatly affected by structures on the river. They can reach around 2 feet and 8 pounds and live about 10 years. The striped bass is a piscivore that moves upriver not only to spawn, but also to feed on other migrating fishes and juveniles. If undisturbed, striped bass can live up to 40 years and reach almost 6 feet and potentially weigh over 100 pounds. However, this fish is very popular for recreational angling and they're commonly found well below the maximum size. Sea lamprey is a parasitic fish that have a variable freshwater larval stage that can range from 5 to 19 years. As an adult, lamprey travel downstream to sea in order to feed on a host fish before returning to spawn after 2 or 3 years. They can reach almost 50 inches and weigh over 5 pounds. A few other examples include Atlantic salmon, brown trout, and short-nosed sturgeon. With the exception of lamprey, the examples shown here are iteroparous, meaning they are capable of spawning multiple times. Lampreys are semelparous and die after spawning once, similar to Pacific salmon. Diversity is essential to management as spawning requirements are often very species specific. Each fish requires certain favorable conditions including photo period, temperature, flow rate, and substrate availability, or they will not spawn. Additionally, some species can become landlocked during migration and form a freshwater subgroup, which has been recorded in both sturgeons and lamprey. Dams serve as a barrier to migrating fish. This map is compiled from U.S. Army Corps of Engineers data collected in 2006. There are over 8,000 major dams in the United States, with a major dam being one that is over 15 meters, or 50 feet. When smaller dams are added into this number, the total jumps to over 75,000. Obviously, dams physically impede upstream migrations, but fish do not simply bump into them and turn around when migrating upstream, nor do they do a cannonball over the top on the way back down. Getting fish over dams both up and downstream has led to research, trial and error, successes and failures for almost 200 years. This is a simple diagram of different barrier passage techniques. The basic idea is that adult fish utilize ladders, elevators, or are collected in a holding pen and carted up or downstream manually. This concept is more complicated than just passing fish over the physical barrier as not every fish can use every device once it's implemented. For example, the Atlantic sturgeon I described earlier is simply too big to use a small fish ladder. In some cases, passage systems themselves can contribute to significant damage or mortality to migrating species. Also, juveniles and iteroparous adults need to get back downstream, but it wasn't until the mid-1980s that national programs called for juvenile fish bypass facilities in order to increase efficiency and reduce damage from spillways. 
There are several ways to accomplish fish passage, each with varying degrees of success. Just as in any wicked problem, there is no one perfect way, and many methods are species-specific. Fish ladders allow fish to slowly climb a slope and utilize pools to rest. These can be very complex and winding, and have not always been successful. Success is usually related to the angle of incline, height of the dam, and pool availability. Smaller distances may not require pools, but these can be highly selective for species size and energy availability, as some species do not feed much after entering fresh water. Natural passages are channels created around the barrier and can be very effective when applicable. A passage can also be ecologically beneficial to the river, as it replaces some natural flow that was lost due to the dam. Unfortunately, natural passages require a lot of room and may result in tricky flow problems dependent on incline. Fish lifts collect fish in a chamber or elevator and lift them over the barrier. They are independent of dam size, can accommodate a wide variety of species, and have been relatively successful in practice. Also, lifts are less disruptive of flow than other methods. However, depending on the specifications of the dam, lifts may require constant human operation at the top. Another similar option would be to collect fish in a holding pen and truck them upstream. In all options, proper location is essential, as fish need to be able to find the mechanism. Passage options are carefully placed relative to the obstacle, so water flow can guide fish into the entrance. Other dangers are presented as fish are impinged at the bottom of a dam. The gathering can lead to heightened predation and over-harvesting. Large electricity producing structures can interfere with fish lateral lines or other electrosensitive systems. Dams cause losses of flowing riverine habitat and create major environmental modifications to the surrounding areas. Even after a fish has passed over a dam, it can actually get lost if a larger lake with a slow flow rate is created above. Unfortunately, getting fish over the dam is only half of the problem, and juveniles or adults returning to marine habitats face their fair share of dangers. The turbines of a hydroelectric dam present a winding gauntlet of death, as fish can easily get caught up in the blades and suffer damage or mortality. Mortality rates can be higher in the Catadromus anguilla species due to their body length and the fact that adults migrate downstream in order to spawn in marine habitats. More recent turbine technologies have been designed with this as a priority. Additionally, the shearing effect from sudden drops and changes in pressure or flow rate can have a detrimental effect on swim bladders and possibly cause rupture. Spillways are the area where water drops over the top of the dam. Research has shown that fish damage increases proportionately with drops over 13 meters, with 100% mortality at 50 meters. More recent surface bypass technology attempts to pass fishes at a level closer to the river's surface rather than down a 40-foot spillway. Modifications or bypass channels can be added to allow fish to pass underneath the structure entirely. While new dams are being constructed all the time, others are being removed and new options for fish become available. Dam removal is an option that removes the barrier, but this is not without a huge short-term and possibly lingering ecological impact on the river system. Sediments can contain trapped PCBs or other contaminants, which can travel downstream rapidly when disturbed. Additionally, greatly increased turbidity can persist after removal. Many ecological studies of dam removals are more recent and therefore many aspects are still being determined. But over time, dam removal is likely the best option. Sea lamprey have been shown to stay near former dam sites after removal, but quickly begin recolonizing the sites and moving upstream afterwards, where they create nests in the substrate. The problem that I would like to examine is the passage of American Shad in the Connecticut River. Not only upstream, but downstream for adults and juveniles to look at ways to increase effectiveness and efficiency. On the left is a map of dams constructed in the Connecticut River watershed. As you can see, there is a large number of dams on the main length of the river and its tributaries. Shad have historically progressed through and utilized 11 of the Connecticut River tributaries in addition to the main river as spawning grounds, 
but access to habitat is currently limited due to the presence of dams that are often located a short distance from the confluence with the main stem. The structures on the tributaries are mostly in various stages of either dam removal, contain some sort of passage method, or in the process of building one, or out of Shad's historical range. The Rainbow Dam on the Farmington River in Windsor, Connecticut does contain operational upstream and downstream Shad passage structures, as well as a viewing gallery for the public. There are eight major dams in the main river, and five of which have historically impeded Shad migration. Shad have been assisted past structures in the Connecticut River for over 250 years. These illustrations are some examples of early designs, often with high slope and often highly unsuccessful. Many were made of wood and destroyed easily by flow surges, but later innovations would greatly improve on these early designs. The Enfield Dam is the first on the main river, but it has been in a state of disrepair for some time and is more easily passable for fish without assistance. Therefore, the first real obstacle for shad on the Connecticut River is the Holyoke Dam. The Holyoke project began as a source for water power in 1848 and has had several remodels and modifications since. The first fish lift in the United States was built at the Holyoke Dam in 1955 for American shad. Originally, the design suffered from operational problems and fish had to be removed by hand, which greatly increased mortality. Additionally, attracting fish to the lift was still a problem. Refinements of the lift led to improvements, but also led to new problems, such as overcrowding of the chambers during peak shad runs. Before the lift, shad would congregate and spawn at some point below the dam, sustaining the population but serving as an easy target for piscivores like striped bass and human harvest as I described earlier. Overall, the success of Holyoke led to the implementation of other lifts in other United States rivers. In 2014, 370,506 shad were lifted over the Holyoke Dam, which is about 50%. Some are gathered and trucked very far upstream. Currently, much of the preferred habitat in the main river begins upstream of the Holyoke impoundment in about a 40-kilometer stretch to the Turner's Falls Dam. Once shad breach the Holyoke, some of them travel this length, where a different type of upstream fish passage awaits. Turner's Falls in northern Massachusetts is home to a complicated, winding, highly unsuccessful, and downright ugly fish ladder. In 1992, the Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission's Fisheries Management Plan for American Shad identified a management objective of 40 to 60 percent passage for each successive obstacle on the main stem of the river and this would be based off of five-year averages. Of the population that breached the Holyoke, Turner's Falls Dams has averaged an underwhelming 3.8% annual shad passage since 1980. The fish that do make it continue upstream to the inconspicuous Vernon Dam fish ladder in Vermont. This passage achieved rates of 39% and 53% for 2012 and 2013 respectively, but there has been little research on spawning or downstream passage north of Turner's Falls. Migration can continue upstream as far as Bellows Falls in southern mid-Vermont, near the New Hampshire border and the end of the run. Historically, plentiful shad and salmon at the falls there sustained Abenaki tribes for thousands of years before European arrival. Even with improvements in upstream passage, fish still have to return, and as I described earlier, traveling back downstream is no simple matter. Assistance has propelled an increasing number of shad upstream. Unfortunately, after the rigors of migration, traversing lifts and ladders, and spawning, energy constraints take their toll and the majority of fish are sent back down the river in a decidedly less than optimal living state, floating. Through personal communications with Connecticut Deep and unpublished shad movement studies, between 40 to 60 percent of the adult shad that enter the river mouth in the spring pass the Holyoke Dam, but only a small fraction of that returns alive. This is specifically where I would like to focus further research. It's recently becoming more of a focus for the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission Shad Fishery Management Plan whereas earlier there was a prevailing sense that assisted downstream passage was unnecessary. 
Some proposed solutions include manipulating light or using high frequency sounds to propel juveniles and adults away from turbine intakes and guide them into chutes designed for downstream passage. Most of the hydroelectric dams on the main stem of the Connecticut River have implemented some sort of passage channel, but the results are somewhat untested. As you can see from this figure, downstream passage for juvenile shad in this weir design has been improved, but is not ideal when compared to the Atlantic salmon that this system was designed for. While adult shad probably have a tendency to die in large numbers after spawning, a larger percentage of return would be especially beneficial to the resurgence of this species, as fecundity increases with repeat spawnings. Therefore, dams are made likely a major contributor to the heightened downstream mortality rates, historically low marine populations, and suppression of stock recovery in recent years. Marine populations have been sub subject to large age discrepancies, which subsequently has turned characteristic boom or bust shad runs into runs that are more bust than boom. If population structures become too stretched or concentrated in certain age groups, it can lead to catastrophic collapses. Most investigations of this topic are performed by government agencies and conservation groups. The Deep Marine Fisheries Division in Old Lyme promotes research through habitat conservation programs as well as American Shad Studies. The ASMFC runs an interstate commission aimed at the conservation and management of fish stocks as a whole through fisheries management plans. There is a focus on further research regarding aging methods and population structures as well as set goals for passage effectiveness. The Nature Conservancy has created a Northeast Aquatic Connectivity Project which works to strategically reconnect fragmented aquatic habitats through targeted removal or bypass of key barriers to fish passage. In 2009, NOAA allocated $167 million for 50 projects aimed at habitat restoration and blockage removal. This was across the U.S., but several were in New England. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Fisheries Program backed six dam removal or bypass projects in 2014. These are just a few of the agencies with projects involving American shad and habitat restoration in efforts to reverse the historical population lows on the Atlantic coast. I was easily able to find a very applicable funding opportunity using the Pivot COS database. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Fish Passage Program is a conservation assistance program that provides financial and technical assistance to remove or bypass barriers that impede the movement of fish and contribute to their decline. The information for the NSF Director of the Division of Environmental Biology is posted here. I did not come across many active, applicable funding opportunities offered through NSF but some grants offered may allow for American shad research if proposed properly. As must be expected with any project, problems would arise when attempting research on anadromous fish passage. Funding is likely to be competitive, with other projects focused on many different species. For example, the 50 NOAA grants that I mentioned earlier were chosen from a pool of about 800 projects. In the case of shad, fish lifts, elevators, and dam removal has been the focus not only for the good of the species, but also for the recreational benefit of Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire. Downstream passage for shad is still a work in progress, just as upstream passage was for decades. Knowledge of shad behavior has increased, but applying it to passage structure design has been slow. Improving existing structures is complicated, expensive, and in some cases may be unproductive and require trial and error. While these problems would remain, the best way to address them is through future research. This means that short-term solutions may not be ideal, but will be more effective than inaction as long-term solutions are figured out. An effective scientific approach would be to further the understanding of shad behavior and then create designs that capitalize on this knowledge. Additionally, validation and controlled large-scale tests under different conditions would improve practices for the future. Overall, much work is available to be done in order to ensure a sustainable future for American shad in the Connecticut River. For further information, or if you might be interested in working on American shad studies in the Connecticut River, 
I may be able to point you in the right direction. Please feel free to contact me at the email address at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for watching.